views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the hosts and guests, and not necessarily those of the staff or management of altorkradio.net. and welcome to Our Natural Rights here on alltalkradio.net. Mark Sargent, who is my guest this evening, is from Whidbey Island, Washington. He founded the Brimstone Fireworks Company in college, and that was shut down by the ATF his junior year in 1990. He spent three years as a sous chef at a Greek restaurant, won the first computer pinball world tournament in 1994, and was hired by a PC game publisher in Boulder, Colorado that same year. He played computer games for a living until 1997, where he acted as a ringer at conventions to help sell games. And then he stayed in the Boulder technology sector ever since. Not being married and with no children, most of his extensive free time is spent trying to unravel the hidden truths of our civilization and the never-ending search for the meaning of life itself. If Mark had to pick a single motto, it would be, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. A close second is, don't regret what you've done, regret what you haven't. He didn't want to be backing this particular controversy that we'll be talking about tonight. It has to be the craziest thing he could have gotten invested in. He's been looking for something that did not jibe with the globe, and he has seen nothing that doesn't work better within the closed system. Welcome, Mark, and thanks for taking the time for us tonight. Hi, Michelle. Thank you for having me. So I'd like to start just with a little bit about what made you start questioning the globe theory. And I remember you saying something about the monitors at work. Uh, yeah, yeah, the monitors at work. Excellent point. Uh, 15 years ago, and that's not really when I got into it, it was actually right in front of me, and I missed it like most people. Uh, I had a whole bunch of monitors in my office, and uh, they were all laid out, and I thought, you know, it'd be cool if I had the same thing on all the monitors, so I thought I'd do a globe model. And, you know, I did a quick search online and found, uh, you know, did a search for the, the picture of the Earth from space. Mm -hmm. And I noticed, you know, that, that for whatever reason, uh, all the pictures were the same. It was just rows and rows and rows of the same, you know, 1969 shot that shows the bottom half of Africa, all of Antarctica, and mostly a cloudy covered Earth. Mm -hmm. and, it was, and it was literally just one shot. And no matter how much I searched, there was only one shot. And I thought, okay, uh, you know, I'm not going to fight it. You know, I think NASA sucks at this point, and I'll just move on and and uh, and go to another picture because I wasn't going to use that picture. And but you know, and it should have should have stuck in my head then that uh, it, this is 2000, and there was nothing. You know, there was only one picture of the Earth from space. And so, you know, I completely dismissed it, ignored it, and then fast forward to last year, and I'd gone through, you know, just about every conspiracy you could think of up until that point. And uh, by then, you know, I'd gone through, you know, all the major ones. I won't discuss them here, but all the major ones. And there's one conspiracy for those people out there that don't know much about the conspiracy world. There's one conspiracy which is the runt of the litter. It's the one that even the conspiracy guys won't touch because it's just ridiculous. It's it's silly and ludicrous, and and I wouldn't touch it. It's a folder, you know. It's it's the last. It's the movie you never want to watch. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was called the Flat Earth Theory. And so I said, okay, you know, I got frustrated one weekend. It's like, you know what? I'm not going to look at anything else. I'm just going to look at this thing. Going to knock it out in a weekend. Be done with it. And uh, and and you know punch it out and never never look at it again. Mm -hmm. And so I start looking at it, and uh, slowly but surely, you know, some of this stuff started started making sense. And I was going, oh, this can't can't be can't be real. So then I decided to get dedicate some more time to it, and I dug out the. Um, are you familiar with the Orlando Ferguson map? Does that ring any bells to you? No. Okay, it's it's called a flat and stationary Earth. Uh, he was up in uh, South Dakota. He did it in 1830, and uh, he was uh, uh, a big big Bible believer. But he he drew this own map, and it and it wasn't quite flat. And for most people don't, don't understand. It's like you know when 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 I say flat Earth, I don't mean completely flat. I mean it looks somewhat like a cross between a 
a hubcap and a roulette table where you kind of have a bulge in the you know towards the towards the north pole and then it dips down and it sort of raises up just slightly at the edges but that's where i started and i thought okay you know i'm just gonna you know like because i used to design computer games back in the day i'm just gonna treat this like any game simulation and i'm gonna i'm gonna try to build it from scratch and if any of the systems and the, the flat model didn't jibe, I would just abandon the whole thing and, and call it bunk and, and be done with it. You know, I, again, yeah, I was trying to debunk this, you okay. know, just trying to just smash it. So I get, you know, about halfway through the systems and I realize that everything's clicking. You know, all the little parts of the systems are, are working. And so I'm going, OK. In fact, they're working better than a globe model. Uh, you know, everything in a flat model seems to be way more efficient. Uh, and makes more sense. It's way easier to do uh, in a flat model than it is in a globe model. So then I started looking into, you know, the back history. You know, like when did it become a globe? Mm -hmm. You know, when when did our world be become this? You know, what I'm holding in my hand. I know the radio people can't see it, but it's a little globe. Oh yeah, they can uh, see when it. did it become? They can see you. Oh okay. Uh, so when did it become a globe? And uh, it, you know, so I started doing the back history, and yeah, you know, about 1514. You know, Copernicus made the, you know, he, he spearheaded this thing and, and uh, you know, it, it went from a flat model, which we, you know, that's what we knew this place to be right. for, you know, four 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 thousand years, four and a half thousand years. Then it became a globe model. But the problem was when he did it, there was absolutely, we weren't even remotely close to proving uh, you know, because technology-wise, how do you prove that a globe exists? Sure. And uh, so, you know, that was 15, 1500. So you went 16, 17, 18, 1900, 1900. You have the first planes, uh, but you know, planes couldn't even go above the weather until what the late 1930s, early 1940s, maybe even later. You know, until you had pressurized cabins, uh, and then really, it wasn't until uh, the space program, you know, started up in 1957. And as I was looking at that, and as I was looking at the backstory, things got really, really strange. Every the world seemed to everything that that the the world governments and I call them the authority because you know it's governments and very, very rich people and sure. and royalty. I just I just lump them all into one group. Uh, they start everyone started doing really, really strange things. Um, and so, as I was looking at that, I was also looking at places like Antarctica. Which closed, and we can we can talk about that in a bit. Mm -hmm. But the point was is that the globe model started to fall apart, and the more I stared at it, there was n almost nothing that I saw that convinced me that this was actually true. And in, and it, everything just kept going back to the flat model and going back to the flat model. And by the time I did the backstory, then I started looking. Okay, then I started thinking, okay, how would you? convince people it was a globe how would you hide what it really looked like and everything that that i ran into seemed to confirm that oh boy so so now you're you're putting on your tin hat and playing uh twilight zone yep. music in the background and <laughs> yep yep so what i did was i I said, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to dig in, you know, so then I started, you know, really looking into the, you know, the, the groups that were doing flat earth uh -huh. and I started, you know, looking at it and, you know, everyone was really kind of scattered and all over the place. And, you know, once I did all the research, including, you know, all the backstories and the timelines, I decided to put together uh, a video series and I called, and I called it flat earth clues. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, as you know, you've watched it, I put it out there and, you know, three weeks ago. And not just the flat earth community, but all the communities seem to, to, you know, they've really had a positive response to this because I hit just about everything. You know, I did, I did a guide and then I did nine separate clues, right. which right. covered everything. And again, when I built these, you know, I did the same thing like when I was trying to figure out, you know, how this globe thing worked. I was trying to debunk it. It was like, okay, you know, I was, I was debunking my work as I was doing it. So if there was a clue, and I never threw away a clue. So if there was a clue I didn't like, I wasn't going to do it. And, uh, you know, so by the time I got to the last one, which went into the GPS tracking in the Southern Hemisphere, mm -hmm. I, I knew I had something. Uh, so, and, yeah, and, there's and, definitely something here. Yeah. So, uh, well, that's... you know, when we were talking, we talked just a minute ago about how the, this model was, in fact, accepted by all the the major religions on the planet, right? Yep. 
Yep. Um, and so I kind of did a little bit of digging in terms of uh, biblical support for this. Sure. And so what I, I went to a couple of uh, Bible passages and I went to some definition pages and, and basically this is what I got because what we have not yet discussed is what you call the closed system. So I'm, I'm going to kind of breach that topic and then feel free to jump in sure. or to, to contradict sure. me or whatever. Okay. So we have in Genesis the reference to, to the firmament and God yep. creating the firmament to separate the waters above the earth from those below. Yep. The, the word has been anglicized from Latin, which was firmamentum, which appears in the late 4th century Latin translation of the Bible. This in turn is derived from the Latin root firmus, which is cognate with firm. The notion of solidity is advanced explicitly in several biblical passages. The notion of a sky as a solid object rather than just as an atmospheric expanse was widespread among both ancient civilizations and primitive cultures, including ancient Greece, Egypt, China, India, Native Americans, Australian Aborigines, and also, clear, also early Christians. The sky is depicted as a solid dome arched over the earth in both Mesopotamian and Indo-European mythologies and in poetry. The Sumerian sky god An, An ruled these firmament-like heavens, which the wind god had separated from the flat disk of the earth below. In Isaiah 40.22, we see it is, it is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the, the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. So in Isaiah, he calls it a circle, not a globe or a sphere, but a circle. And I, I just, I'm kind of fascinated by that because I, I was raised as a Christian. You know, I was raised yep. in, in the LDS church, and, and of course the the idea of the firmament, and I just, I have to tell you that this whole concept of firmament drove me crazy. <laughs> if it's a firmament, that means it's firm, and if it's firm, then it's not sky, and it's not expanse, and it's not nebulous, and it's not millions of miles out there. So that yep. has stuck yep. in my craw for years. Perfect. Everything you listed there is absolutely perfect, and those were the little details I kind of left out when I was discussing the, the major religions. You you hit them pretty much all. Okay. Uh, and and yeah, that's what I was going to look for. Really, was the firmament uh, because because yeah, I mean, four and a half thousand years of religions saying, look, it's an enclosed system. There's there's some sort of barrier. Now, you know, some of the flat earthers will, will, will debate on what kind of that barrier is. You know, is it is it solid? Is it permeable or whatever? But the firmament is about as good as explanation as any. And so when I look, went looking for the model to disprove this, I went looking for the firmament. You know, let's let's okay. just call it what call it what it is. So there were two things I was looking at. And the first one was uh, when, you know, when was the firmament discovered? Let's just, you know, we'll just okay. use that word, word from this point forward. Okay. And from what I could tell, and, and you know, I, I touched on this a little bit in the videos. And again, you know, I encourage everyone really to go through them. You know, I'm, I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of this. Mm -hmm. But what seemed to happen was if there was an ancient culture, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into groups necessarily like the Masonic or the Illuminati or, or pick. Just let's, let's say you were royalty hundreds of years ago and someone gave you a map that showed you the true, you know, uh, nature of the world and what it looked like. Uh, you know, let's say you were, uh, you know, the king of Spain in, in 1600. Okay. What, what, what would you do with it? There's nothing, there's nothing you can do with it. I firmly believe, uh, no play on words there, that, uh, that, that nobody really knew. I mean, it was passed on from generation to generation uh, as far as the elites were concerned, that yeah, they, they probably knew what the earth looked like. But until you see it, until you have one of your own um, uh, team that actually goes out and, and says and confirms it on their own, mm -hmm. what do you really know? Right. Uh, there's no technology to do it. So everything seemed to be fine up until about uh, you know the early 1900s, and that's when we started exploring mm -hmm. what you know what we like to call the North and the South Pole. Right. And there was a guy named uh, Admiral Byrd, and you watched this. Uh, he, he went up to the North Pole. 1926, and then uh, he was recruited to start doing expeditions in the South Pole starting 1928. And he went down, he, I think he had done four expeditions down there between 1928 and 1955. And 
you know, he did an interview in 1954, and it looked like, for, from what I could tell, they were sending him down there to see if they could find it. But he wasn't finding it. Okay. And so I think it, I think at one point they didn't even know it was there. You know, it was like, well, you know, he's already been down there four times and he hasn't found it. So maybe we should just start, you know, using this thing up for resources, you know, because Antarctica has millions and millions of square miles of, of, of resource rich land that most people don't know about. Mm -hmm. So he goes down for one more expedition. So, so the interview, and again, uh, there's a clip on it, you know, that I, that I put in my clues in 1954 and you, you saw it where – he, he, he's talking about the resources, you know, his entire mountain range made out of coal. There's, there's um, oil, there's minerals, there's uranium. And every, you know, Russia's down there, England's down there. Basically, the, the surviving allies from, from World War II, uh, New Zealand, Argentina, Chile, they're, they're all there. And everything's going great. And then he goes down for one last mission in 1955 to 1956 called Operation Deep Freeze. And... He finds it. You know, there, there's no doubt in my mind he found it because one day everything was great and, you know, Antarctica was made out of money and it was, you know, again, it's that gag. It's like, you know, one day it's like, we are going to make money, you know, right? And then they see it. It's like, we are leaving. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone, they could not get off the ice fast enough. And everyone cleared out of Antarctica and uh, and all of a sudden – you know, they put up a treaty that most people don't even know about, you know, the, the Antarctica Treaty, and they sealed off Antarctica permanently. And, and that treaty from, is still in place to this day. It's still in effect to this day. There were 10 nations that signed it in 1959, and every industrialized nation that comes online, you know, when your country becomes, you know, technologically relevant, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're forced to sign it. You know, you're, it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you're not going down to Antarctica ever. And, <laughs> and you know, they don't even question it. And and, uh, and and for me, that was absolutely ludicrous. That's not how the world works. Everybody knows that, um, especially nowadays, you know, with energy resources sure. being being as limited as, as they were. Is like as soon as I saw that, I was like, there isn't an oil company around that would ignore this. You know, they're they're trying to get into national parks. Exactly. You know, they're, and they're lobbying. They're spending millions of dollars and and to, on senators and and congressmen to try to get in there. And there's nothing, you know, as far as Antarctica concerned. Again, most people don't understand. It's like there's no there's no indigenous population. There's no animal life. There's no plant life unless you count the emperor penguins. But they're really on the fringe anyway. Mm -hmm. So they seal that off in uh, 1959. And about that same time. They are doing uh, high altitude nuclear testing uh, straight up. Uh, you know, in the, the, both the United States and Russia are firing nuclear weapons uh, straight up. And, and I don't want to get into the debate as, as far as, you know, the nuclear fission conspiracy thing. But the, the fact is they're sending high explosives up and they're sending up and they did it for four years. And so I started looking. And it's like, OK, well, let's say they found the firmament. Let's say they found the outer edge, mm -hmm. uh, or whatever the, whatever you want to call it out there. Something was something spooked them to such a degree. Something was so jaw dropping that you seal off an entire continent, and you don't even open it for debate. I think the treaty right now is not up for revision until the year two thousand forty one. Wow! It, again, which is r uh, utterly ridiculous. And then I go, okay, if you're going to do that, well, then you got to deal with the the upper part. You know, because the firmament is really, you know, everyone says, you know, it's the it's the upper part of the sky. Uh -huh. I said, you know, if it was me, the first thing I would do is nationalize the um, the space program, you know, which which it was. It was militarized. People again, NASA is a military organization. Make no mistake about that. Sure. And for me, and I'm going to steal something from another flat earther because he, he actually said it more eloquent, eloquently than me, which was. The only reason uh, – eventually you have to take a picture or fake a picture of where we are. Right. You, you've got to continue down that road. Unfortunately, you can't just fake a picture and hand it to people because eventually people are going to go, well, how did you get the picture? Sure. So you have to create an entire division. You have to create a space program to at least stage the event to take the picture, if you even you know what I mean. Right. Okay. So – so 
you can't you can't again you can't hand out flyers and say oh yeah this is earth this is earth because <laughs> it, it no one's gonna no one's gonna buy it. the first thing is oh who took the picture right so you you have to create a rocket program even if the rockets aren't going up that high you have to create a rocket program so that people have something to connect the two uh-huh. uh and then you know nasa oh you know then it you know it starts up and and they have to create a, you know a space program which you know in in many conspiracy circles has already been you know blown full of holes sure. and you have to fake everything but but that's but the secondary part of nasa is uh it's it you know the first part is the picture you got to get the image out there mm-hmm. but and they only took one uh <laughs> the, the, you know well again but again that that i'm sorry they only released one they didn't take any uh, but the other part is you have to make sure that there are no private space programs. Uh, that's that's the big key. You can't uh, you can't allow people. You you have to make sure that anybody that wants to go to space goes through NASA, which is the United States military, right. uh, because you you have to control the skies. So and that worked. That was actually very proactive, and it worked very well for them. Uh, they went from uh, you know the 1960s. All the way to I don't know when um, uh, the guy from Microsoft and the guy from Virgin Air, uh, Airways started up their programs, but they you know they've been just running into horrible you know things right and left you know they're not going anywhere. In fact, uh, the Virgin Airways thing you know and I mentioned that it's like look you're either going to sabotage it, you're going to slow it down, you're going to create huge delays, uh, or you're going to uh, you're just going to get them into the fold. You know if you're NASA you're going to come to them and say hey look why don't you work for us mm-hmm. or we'll buy or we'll buy you out or you know, you know, I, the last thing, of course, you would do is fess up to them. Sure. So those two things. Yeah. Between those two things, you know, that it, for me, it, for me, my point of no return was Antarctica because it went against everything that we are, you know, and well, I'm not sure. just talking. And, and everything that we've seen, those of us who are digging into this rabbit hole, it, it goes completely against the the authorities determination of conquest and and pillage and oh, and yeah. uh, you know br- spreading democracy to the world that eventually just you know rapes and pillages and and yeah. absconds with the resources and that's all that, thereafter very true and you know people again people don't understand because this is one of those pieces of history that's just been you know swept under the rug or shoved into the cover so far you're never going to see it it wasn't just America that pulled out. Everybody pulled out. It was unilateral. Right. Who, who agrees to this? You know that you know Ru- Russia and England and the United States unilaterally decide to you know pull out all at the same time with all that money sitting on the ground. Not a chance. Yeah. Not a chance. So at that point, you know they they just had to you know keep the secret as best they could. And uh, but as I mentioned to you, uh, and I don't know if you want me to talk about this now. There's there's three rules you know they can't break and the one that is the easiest to spot at least for you and me and anyone listening is the uh, is the flight paths. Yeah, and and I do want to get into that. I I wanted to. Do you want to get into something else first? Well, just from the point of view of of this the USGS map. Now, see that was that was ah. pretty interesting to me. That was <laughs> that was, that was a little hidden nugget that I found. Yeah. When I was when I was out there, you want me to talk about that? Sure. Okay. The USGS map. So, the, you know, when you look at map projections of the world, and this was in clue number three called Map Makers, uh, there is – when you go down, there's projections of the map. See uh, the um, – the Mercator map, which is in most schools, so when you pull down the blackboard, you know, or you know, pull down the map in front of the blackboard, that's right. the map you see is the Mercator map. The one that schools are trying to change to is the Gall Peters map, which prospectively shows a more accurate depiction of what the continents look like, so it's not skewed European. Um, but there's a map about I don't know halfway down. It's a circular map called the, and I hope I don't butcher it here, the Azimuthal Equidistant projection. Okay, I'm showing yeah. that right now. And it uh, it is the uh, it is the top down view of the world, looking down from the North Pole, and so you it's a squished view of the world with Antarctica instead of Antarctica being a continent because you can't see it if if this was you know if you squished it Antarctica is just a giant ring of uh, frozen land around the outside. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting about this map 
is that well there's three things that are interesting about this map the, the first is when you look at it in wikipedia uh is that it is linked to and it's the only map of all these projections that are on there they're linked to anything is linked to the usgs and for those of you who are the united outside the united states and probably most of you inside the united states you really should know these things is it stands for the uh, united states geologic survey right which is a government organization that, that specializes in a lot of things, but they specialize really in geography and geology. And that is the map that they reference in their world atlas. And I thought that was very, very interesting because if you go to the flat earth section of Wiki, it is the exact same map. Right. And, but it is not linked. It is it is it is their own map, but they're absolutely if you lay over them top of each other, it's absolutely identical. Mm -hmm. So why is one why is it not why is it not linked? Um, and the other thing is is that it is not just used by the USGS. You're thinking, well, that may be a fluke. It's also used by the United Nations. In fact, it is the United Nations flag. Okay, here comes the United Nations. So when you look at the United Nations flag, you are looking at the azimuthal equidistant map, which is used by the USGS, and it is also the flat earth map. And what's interesting about the United Nations flag, and was pointed out by several people, uh, including the NASA channel, which I'm going to give credit to here, is because uh, he put it in all his shows, is that there's no Antarctica on that on that flag. That's right. <laughs> and, you know, it's one of those things that misses everybody. It's like, okay, so it's a giant continent, seven, you know, plus million miles, square miles, and you're not putting it on there. Mm -hmm. Why? So is it assumed? Is it the outer ring? You know, the outer ring? Is it the, um, uh, is it the wreaths, the spiky wreaths on the outside? They never address it. Uh, and you'd think, you know, the United Nations being, you know, all one world, all one people, that you would include that somewhere. You would change the map to account for it. But they don't. Uh, and then another little trivia about that map is um, the uh, the reference. You could Because you can see who proposed it and what year it was proposed. And this is the part that really I, I was like going, wow. It's it's not even in your face. They're just – I think somebody just left it in there and, and didn't, didn't notice, which was uh, – it, it was initially proposed a thousand years ago. So you, you look and you think you're seeing a typo when it says, you know, pro first proposed in 1000 AD. So you look at the guy who proposed it, and I'm not going to do his long name because it's Persian and it's really long, but the short version is Al Biruni, A L, I think B I R U N I. Uh -huh. And, and you're, thinking, you're thinking, who is that guy? <laughs> and Al Biruni was a Persian scientist, lived a thousand years ago, very well schooled, very educated, a real Renaissance guy when it came to science. And uh, yeah, he was the guy that proposed it. And and again, you're thinking, okay, it's it's completely screwed up. And that's when I noticed because there's a little link on Al Biruni and um there's a moon crater named after him by NASA. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And it's like, okay, why, why, you know, and so that's where I summarized in that, in that video, I said, okay, why is the United States government and the United Nations using a model of the world that was done a thousand years ago by, uh, by a Persian scientist? And you got to remember a thousand years ago, that's when we thought the earth, was you flat. know, was flat. Yeah. So why are you still using this map? Why, why are you even referencing it? And, uh, you know, just these little, these little things, you know, kept creeping in and I was going, man, it, if they're not hiding it, you know, again, so then I, st I started backtracking. It's like, okay, you know, I immediately made the jump. I was like, okay, it's flat. So how do you hide a flat? How do you hide it? How do you hide the world? Exactly. And, uh, it's, it's, it's easier than you might think. Well, you know, when we were, <laughs> when we were doing our little pre-show thing, I was, <laughs> I was really, um kind of taken aback when you said, how, how can you prove a globe without using the word NASA? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'm not going to take credit for that because somebody else came up with it, the, the hive, hive mind of the internet, but it's an absolute point. How can you prove this globe is where you live without using the word NASA? Show me. And, and don't use, don't use a word like Magellan. Cause I think we were still burning witches back then. So <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't throw me that stuff. You know, you got to give me something modern. And 
And you say, well, you know, it's well, why can't I use the word NASA? I was like, well, one, NASA is, uh, you know, again, I'm not picking on NASA. Don't guys, don't take this the wrong way if you're listening. Uh, NASA is a military organization, so it's, you know, they're going to um, secure some information based on their discretion. Sure. And they decided 50 years ago that, you know, again, it's the old argument, and, and we'll get into it in a second. The old argument is. Let's say, you know, you went along and you were been passing this globe around in classrooms for the last, you know, 20 generations. Let's say it wasn't a globe. Who would you tell? Exactly. Would you tell people? <laughs> would you tell people? Would you let them in on it? Uh, you know, I, I do not, you know, I, I got to be honest. If I was there, you know, even though I like, you know, I like disclosing information, but man, it's a, it's a tough call because things change. And I don't know if we have time to talk about it, but we may get to that. But I cover it in um, one of my videos called Status Quo. Right. And that's, that's a really good one. In fact, they're all great because they build on each other, actually. So I would okay. definitely recommend those. Um, so let's go to the moon mission. Oh, <laughs> which which part? <laughs> well, you know, we, you were saying earlier that they had to concoct a, a space industry in order to be able to establish a picture of the globe. Yeah, and then you have to continue it from there. Right. You have to. The moon missions were, and and people are going, well, you know, I've already read in some of the forums, like, why are you talking about the moon stuff when we're talking about flat Earth? The two don't connect to each other, and I I completely disagree because the space program initially was designed to protect this model right. uh, and the moon mission was a continuation of that in order to discourage private space programs the one of the easiest way to do it is to set a goal like the moon you go uh, you know you pretend you go and you keep going to the point where it seems repetitive you know because i think they they went six times but only landed five because of apollo 13 and uh and you go because you don't want you don't want to give any ambition to a private space program. You, you want to just shut it all down. You want to control everything from birth to death. So when you go to the moon, it completely takes the wind out of the sails of anybody. It, it takes that motivation out of anybody that was aspiring to do that. Mm -hmm. Because if you waited long enough, you know, same thing with the picture. If you don't take the picture, if you, if you wait too long to take the picture, you're going to have somebody in the private sector that's going to say, I'm going to take the picture and I'm going to get the rights. I'm going to make a, a, a bunch of cash. Mm -hmm. uh, with the moon, same sort of thing. I mean, imagine, you know, if a corporation, because they'd get sponsors, you'd get banners up there. You'd get Coca-Cola and Frito-Lay and, and whoever you want. They're, they put banners on them. Yeah, but the point is, you're not going there anyway. But they would back you. It would be very easy to get the capital together. Sure. On Unless a government, unless the government decided, you know, took over the you know the the whole motivation. Sure. So. So the um, the picture that we have, which is whatever it is, it's a composite. It's a you know they've given us ten thousand reasons why we can't have pictures of the planet because oh yes. well it just it has to be taken in chunks by the satellites that are yep that are yep. circumventing the globe and then we have to composite them so it's, this this goes back to your your number one question that they can't answer doesn't it and that that's that there's there's never been a 360 event that's occurred in space or on the moon or any absolutely there's there's three rules that can't be broken and I'll, I'll try to be brief uh the the the, the, the first rule, which again, I didn't find, you know, it's the internet hive mind. The internet is very, very resourceful and do not sell them short because they will find everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and the first one is, for some strange reason, no space program, you know, no, no mission, especially the moon. I will use the moon as, as, as the benchmark here. But no space station, no uh, anything in an exterior of a spacecraft. No one has taken the camera and done a 180. You know, basically just turned around. I do it here, but my headset probably pop off. Okay. Uh, no, nobody has ever done a 180 where you just turn around. You know, panning shot. You keep the camera running. You turn around, mm -hmm. and statistics sh say that it should have happened by accident decades ago, just by accident. You know, but they cannot do it because it's one of the rules, and that is if the program is fake. There's certain things you can't, there's certain rules you can't break. And one is all the program, you know, everything you do is either on a stage or a simulator and the simulators are all interior, but anything on a stage, like anything in Hollywood, there's only three walls. 
there is no fourth wall. The fourth wall is the studio audience. The fourth wall is the directors. So you can't turn around. And it and they haven't. You know, and, and again, that's mind boggling that, that people haven't picked up on that. But sixty years of of all sorts of fun stuff. But again, the moon is is the perfect example. It's like it, the first thing you would do if you were on the moon is is take a panning shot and it's never happened. Wow. Okay. So yeah, second can... I'm sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go ahead. Second rule. Second rule is you cannot have a picture of this from space because you cannot get far enough to do it, which is why 15 years ago when I was looking for these pictures, they didn't exist. There was only one shot. I'm going, again, it's the year 2000. There's space shuttles. There's all sorts of fun stuff taking pictures, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's releasing them. And that, it, it, again, you know, that's, it's, it's, there's money to be had there. You, you copyright those images. You, there's no reason why you would do that. But, so you forward to today and you do a search and anybody can do this and there's plenty of YouTube videos that reference it. I haven't really, I didn't go into great detail, but if you do a Google image search for the Earth from space, everything you see will be a composite. Right. Everything will be uh, layers and layers of what they are, you know, passing off as Earth. And I, most of it was done out of desperation because they had they had no other pictures. You know, people were complaining. Mm -hmm. You know, like like me, you know, you had to have the shots. And every once in a while, and you'll see it in there, you know, I include it in some of my videos, you'll see the original 1969 or 68 image or whatever it is showing Africa and Antarctica. And don't think for a second that the only continent they showed, you know, in full was Antarctica. Don't think that was a coincidence. You know, you killed two birds with one stone there. Not only did you, get, not only did you fake a picture of the Earth, you faked a picture of Antarctica. Uh -huh. I got, I saw what you did there. <laughs> Okay, so that brings us to the third rule, and that's the where I'd like to go with the, the Southern Hemisphere travel okay. maps are all wrong. Okay, I learned about this last year sometime. There was a, um, a German guy who posted a video, and uh, what he had done was – he was he was basically just poking around trying to get flights in the southern hemisphere. That's basically everything below the equator, and that includes South America, Australia, and a big chunk of Africa. And he realized that when he was trying to fly from uh, Australia to South America, he couldn't really get any direct flights. And uh, you're thinking, wow, you know, it's the airlines, you know, who knows what's going on. But the connections were really, really strange. They were sending him on really, really long distances that they shouldn't have been. And, and even though it was in German, I got what he was saying. So as I was building this, I started looking at stuff. And sure enough, I spent, I don't know, probably a good couple days just, you know, doing pretend bookings, you know, on flights. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, when you were trying to go, yeah, from, from let's say, Buenos Aires to Sydney, Australia, it would uh, it would send you to some really weird, weird places in directions you wouldn't expect. You know, like uh, like if you were leaving Sydney, Australia, uh, there's no real reason to, you know, it should be just a straight shot across the ocean. It's only 7,400 miles. Right. You know, on, on a globe, it, you know, it, for those of you who know your geography, it's just the South Pacific Ocean. It's easy. Sure. There's, it there's, should, there's, it there's should no... be like as the crow flies, just. It, it, exactly. Right. And so I remember specifically there was one that stuck out because I, I thought I was going to go crazy. Uh, I was trying to go from uh, Christchurch, New Zealand to, uh, I think it was Buenos Aires. And no matter what I did, they kept bumping me a connection. So so it didn't even matter. So, like, I tried to go straight from Christchurch, right? And they, and they sent me to Auckland. I said, you know, fine, I'll, I'll start in Auckland. Auckland sent me to Sydney. All right, I'll start in Sydney. <laughs> Sydney sent me to Dubai, which is... <laughs> The Middle East, you know, and I'm going, why in the world would you send me up there? And, you know, the flight takes way longer than it should. Mm -hmm. And and again, you know, 95 percent of the flights and anyone can, can do this in the southern hemisphere. If you're going from anywhere around Australia, those are the best examples to anywhere in South America. They're going to bounce around all over the place. Now, that being said, I did have some people because that was video seven. That was called the long haul. Mm -hmm. I did have some people that came back. And said, well, you know, there's these there's these nonstop flights, which really are, are screwing your, your whole system up there. Yeah. And, and, and you 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 were one of the people, you know, that said, look, you're going to have to address this. And so, all right, all right, fine. I will figure this out. I don't know how I will figure this out, but I'm going to figure it out. So I stared at the screen, and, and what I did was uh, I opened up PlaneFinder.net, which is a real-time – and people – you know, some people know this, but you can open up you know, PlaneFinder.net or LiveTracker24. Basically, it's a real-time GPS system that tracks flights from point A to point B. Okay. 
Okay. Piece of cake. And so it monitors anywhere from three to 7,000 flights at any given time in the world. It's all real time. It runs 24 seven. And I was taking a look at the oceans and I was really taking a look at those nonstop flights, you know, that supposedly went, there was one no, notorious one that went from uh, Santiago, Chile to um, Johannesburg, I think. Okay. And, but that didn't really matter. The point was I was looking at the oceans and I stared at the oceans and I'm staring at the oceans. I'm staring at the oceans for days and I'm not seeing any planes cross. And then I was going, that doesn't make any sense because at the very least, I don't care. About, at this point, I didn't care about the nonstops. I was going, well, you know, connections are going to go over the oceans. Uh -huh. You know, you're going to you're going to bounce over these oceans. So I started watching planes coming out of South America and South America on a globe doesn't actually it, it's not part of the, the, the flat earth argument. But, you know, I, I figured, well, I'll just watch some of these planes. There was a plane leaving Buenos Aires heading towards uh, Johannesburg, gets off the coast a couple hundred miles. I go and get some to drink, and it disappears. And I go, okay, that's <laughs> fine. Maybe it's nothing. So I take a look again, and I look at the flights, and every flight, doesn't matter where it's coming from, it doesn't matter what direction, as long as it's in the southern hemisphere, as soon as it gets out over open water, the plane vanishes. On, and on GPS, right? On GPS, okay. drops off of GPS, GPS entirely, and then when you look at the specific flight log, it drops off the flight log after that as well. And the flight log says that it, instead of showing its location, it shows that it goes into what they call either approximate mode or estimated mode. Oh, wow. And, and these planes vanish, completely disappear. And then, then it hit me. It's like, that's how they're doing it. Because the third rule is there's no shortcut on a flat map. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can – so that being that there's no shortcut, you have to find a way the, – basically the plane will have to fly a route that it normally wouldn't because the map's wrong. But you have to hide the route. And the only way they could come up with – and I think I have a better idea if they ever want to hire me – is to, to do this route. The only way they could hide it was to make the planes disappear. And since they couldn't just pick, you know, those nonstops, uh -huh. they hid every flight in the Southern Hemisphere. So if it's over land, you'll see it. And, and, and the Northern Hemisphere looks perfectly fine. There's planes flying all over the Northern Hemisphere all day long. But and, in the Southern And they cross the oceans in the Northern Hemisphere. Oh, they cross the oceans. Oh, yeah, all right. the time, which is, which is why I'm staring at them. Yeah. But in the Southern Hemisphere, they decided the, the only way they can keep this secret is to hide the flights entirely. So those of you who are emailing me and saying, hey, what about that Santiago Chile flight? It's like, look, it doesn't matter. The flight may exist, but you can't tell me how they got from point A to point B because that data is erased. It is, it is completely hidden. And people, you know, people again come back and say, uh, well, you know, that's how, well, that's just how GPS works in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm going, what are you talking about? <laughs> GPS, the entire point of gps is to track the flights from point a to b don't tell me that the flights are are going to uh you know that they're just vanishing and you know I, i'm gonna throw it in there you probably don't want to hear it on air but it's like look that malaysia flight uh, that yeah. I, I guarantee that wasn't tracked so it you know basically it, if you're on the southern hemisphere if your flight goes over the ocean you're on your own and and it's done it's not done for the reasons you think it's done because you have to you have to hide the routes because the routes don't make any sense. Well, and, and then you know it's it's probably important at this point to clarify that the GPS system that we have all learned to to love or hate, depending on your perspective, is a military application. Oh, sorry, I completely left that out. The GPS system was designed by the United States military. Uh, it tracks you know where you are on your phone. Hey, that's fine, but it also tracks every every plane in the world. Um, that's uh, you know that's not a that's not a private plane that that has a transponder. Mm -hmm. Every every cargo plane, every military plane, every commercial plane, and there is no reason at all to hide. There's I'm sorry. There's one reason to hide the flights in the southern hemisphere, and that is you have to keep people from looking. You know you don't want people looking down there mm -hmm. because if you saw how someone got actually got from South America to Australia, you would see that it doesn't make sense. If you're looking on a globe, if you're leaving South America, you do not, there is no reason for you to cross the United States and, you know, completely on the other side to go 
you know, to, to Australia. There's no reason to do that unless the map is wrong. And the map is wrong. It's, it is flat. I'm telling you, <laughs> watch, watch, you know, you'll, you'll see it if you, if you look hard enough, but it takes two seconds, planefinder.net. You'll, you'll start noticing it. Okay. So based on, you know, this premise that we've laid here and the, the concept of, of flights and, and the time it takes to go from point A to point B, et cetera. Yep. Let's say we have, if we, if we accept the premise that the world is spinning towards the east and it is moving at approximately 1,000 miles per hour, yep. then flights, let's say, that go from San Francisco to Tokyo and from Tokyo to San Francisco should, yep. should take the same amount of should not take the same amount of time. Should not take the same amount of time. And 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 this is and this is an argument I didn't talk about in the videos because I don't want the math geeks to start throwing out physics. But I'm gonna I'll give you the choice because you you can't have it both ways. And that is if the Earth is spinning a thousand miles an hour and your plane is flying with the spin, then that's fine. You know you can say well you know the gravity's locked it down and and it's and it's going with the planet. Right. However, if the plane is coming from the exact opposite destination, going the opposite way. Then why against are those, the spin? Against the spin, then why are those planes? Why do they have the same uh, amount of travel time in between the two? And of course, there's variations for the jet stream and crap like that, which we won't get into. Why is there about the same amount of travel time? Because you can't have it both ways. The plane is either going with the spin or it's going against the spin. But if you're, you know, point A to point B, point B to point A should not be the exact same thing. Right. And and I, I think you're, I know where you're going on this next one, and that is, on the same on the same thing. If the Earth is rotating at a thousand miles an hour, that means if you're at the, at the equator, and I'm rounding down to a thousand miles an hour. Okay. If you if you're at the equator, it's spinning at a thousand miles an hour. However. If it's a globe, then if you're standing at the North Pole, you're spinning at zero miles an hour. Right. So, centrifugal force, no different than a merry-go-round. You know, a merry-go-round tries to throw you off if you're at the edge. But if you're standing in the middle of the merry-go-round, it's perfect sunny skies. <laughs> so, if if the spin is 1,000 miles at the equator and zero at the, at the pole, then why – then, then – Centrifugal force would say that there should be a, a weight difference. So if you weigh 200 pounds at the North Pole, then when you get to the equator, the centrifugal force, I'm not saying you weigh 20 pounds less. I'm not even saying that you weigh 8 pounds less. But you are going to weigh a little bit less, something measurable. Mm -hmm. If that's a fraction of an ounce, I, it should be consistent. And yet nobody, nobody talks about it. You know, 1,000 miles an hour is a lot of speed. And uh, it's like, yeah, it's a big world, you know, 25,000 miles around, but, you know, it's still, you know, you still got to take that into account. Okay, so we've got about five, a little bit more than five minutes. And so okay. um, what do you want? What I would like you to, to tell us is if everything that we've talked about is true, then why are they spending the kind of money they are on, on space technology and, and rocket ships and da 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 da? That's a good one. Um, they don't want to. <laughs> I wouldn't want to either. Uh, if it was if it was my show, uh, you you would want to spend as little money as possible, because um, because some a lot of this technology is is being used for nothing. Uh, and I, I'm going to use my neighbor here. I'm going to throw his name in because chances are he 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 wouldn't listen anyway because he moved out. Um, I had a neighbor. Uh, his name was Wayne Ottinger. He was an old NASA uh, tech guy, nuts and bolts guy. He actually built. Um, he was first name based with all the astronauts, and he built the original moon lander, which was supposed to be a convertible, by the way, but that couldn't work really in the whole studio production. So, uh, but he built that, and you know, spent millions of dollars, and and you know, his entire career, you know, was was spent building this, and it was never used. You can spend, you have to spend the money. It just, it promotes industry, but you spend the money because you have to spend the money. You know, you, you have to build – the space program has to employ jobs. You have to make it seem somewhat feasible. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't just say – again, like the picture. You can't just take the picture. You, you have to explain how you took the picture. And if sure. that means you have to hire every engineer and nerd that wants to get into the program, you hire them. You pay them the money. You build the stuff. 
and you send it up and you destroy it <laughs> or you make it crash somewhere else. It, it, no, no offense to those guys. It's like, hey, look, you know, you're doing your life's work. My, my neighbor couldn't have been more proud to be a part of NASA because they weren't, they, they weren't in on the loop um, well, like him. But you, you still have to go through the motions. You know, it's, it's like anything. It's like any charade. It's like, well, it's like a movie set. You sure. know, look at the big movies that the extras aren't aren't actually really doing anything. You know, they're being paid lots of money. It's for the illusion. Right. Uh, and it's so, and it's it's a very well financed one. Oh, yeah, definitely. So if we have NASA acknowledging in when was it, 58, 59, that there's this uh, radioactive Van Allen belt. Uh -huh, yeah. That, that nobody can break through because it's so terribly dangerous. And yet we still have a moon landing. How do you how do you justify or rationalize yeah. that? Yeah, you know, that was one of those things I think backfired on them. It was one of those little nuggets of truth, and we don't have time for the full story on my side. I have a great example of it. But it, it, I think it was also a move to discourage private space programs initially. It's like, you know, they they didn't admit that there was a there was a solid structure up there. They didn't admit there was a firmament. But what they did say in 1959, which coincidentally was – the same year they killed, you know, that they shut, shut down Antarctica. I don't right. think that was a coincidence. They, the same year they did that, they said, oh, yeah, by the way, there's a, there's a belt of radiation that you can't, you know, you can't get through. It's super, super dangerous. But unfortunately, they had already committed to, you know, the, the, the program. I don't I, – I think it was probably a bad move to say that because nowadays, now you know, you know, we know that the, the space capsules that threw that didn't have even near enough protection if – the radiation belt was even real, right. you know. So, so basically, you fake a radiation belt if it's if that's even real, and then you you have to fake a craft to go through it. Unfortunately, the technology that you have to go through it doesn't doesn't match up with what you're trying to go through. Right. So, so it's like, oh, we're just sending them anyway, and they're fine, and yeah, don't worry about it. Yeah, don't. But, and and NASA, you know, we just call it never a straight answer. We don't even bother to call it NASA. Uh, yeah, uh, so good. I thought that was fascinating, and then. We've got a minute and a half, so you get to okay. explain this in a minute and a half. Okay. okay. How Shoot. do we explain the movement of the sun across the sky and the equinox, solis, solis, solstices, seasons, and tides? Got it, got it, got it. I'll lump it all up in one thing. Okay. Uh, stars, planets, sun, moon. Okay, we'll, we'll break it in two sections real quick. Stars and the planets, they are projected. They are not there. They are a beautiful, beautiful image. You can look at them. I encourage people to go out and stare at the stars. They're great. The moon is being projected on. I do not know what the moon is, and a lot of people don't either. I encourage people to, to visit a YouTube channel called Crow777. He takes high-def pictures of the moon, uh, uh, you know, high-def movies, and he's found some really, really weird stuff. Yeah. The sun... The sun appears to be a projection system of its own. It is not 92 million miles away. I do not know how far away. It could be, as far as I know, a light bulb in a cage. I hate to say <laughs> it. Well, and, and then we've got scientists like um, Eric, oh, what's his name? Eric Dollard, who is saying it's not a fission. It's not a fusion. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's yeah, listen to that guy. I mean, he sounds like a crazy person in a car, but it makes sense. And in this model, it makes perfect sense. He's saying, he goes, yes, I don't know what the sun is, but it's not what people think it is. Right. It, yeah, it's it's generating light, but uh, he goes, it's, there's no fusion there. There's something else going on. Right. And, uh, and I totally, totally buy into it. And it, it mostly um, resonates with the electrical, the electric universe, the electric sun. Yeah, know, yeah. Those he called types it, of things. He called it a transformer, which sounds a lot like a big light bulb, doesn't it? Sure enough. Uh, All right. Well, we made it. I think we, cool. we touched almost everything I wanted to touch on, and you did a superb job. So I'd like to send everybody to Flat Earth Clues. Uh, Mark Sargent is the, the gentleman that we've had here tonight and does those videos very well. And he also invites your comments by email or by calling him. And, yep, my, uh, my phone number's on there. Feel free. And he may need to actually create another phone line because it's getting a little nutsy out there. <laughs> so yeah. thank you so much, Mark. And, and maybe we can expand on this in the future. And uh, I really, really well, appreciate you taking the time tonight. Thank you. It was my pleasure. And we'll see you again next week. We have a, a, a great guest for you, and I urge you to join us. Same time, same place, and we'll see you then.